Okay, welcome everyone. I've gone ahead and hit record. I'm Cindy Skalicki and I will be your host today for our webinar on Savvy Slide Decks. I want to welcome all of you. I'm really excited to share with you some great tips. I've got seven in total that are going to help you transform the way that your slide decks look and feel to your audiences. So as we get going this morning, I may need to, you know, pause to enter a few folks that hop in at the last minute, but I'd like to go ahead and get started. I've got a little bit of an intro here before we get into the nitty gritty and an agenda and things of that nature. I will ask all of you to go ahead and please keep yourselves on mute until we get to the portion today where we will do more discussing. I have a fun little exercise I'm gonna ask you to do right now actually if all of you are familiar with zoom enough to look at your small one by one square there are three dots in the upper right hand corner you are able to change your name i i read this great tip at linkedin over the last week or so and it's kind of a fun way to get started on webinars and I'm going to ask you to do that today. So instead of showing us your name just for the next couple minutes, I'd like you to think about a word that really describes you and your superpower and what you are awesome at. Because I don't have enough time to go through and introduce everyone today and have you all take, you know, one or two minutes. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and switch out the name that's in your little square box right now and think of a word, maybe two, that really describes what you are great at. Maybe it's your industry, maybe it's an adjective, maybe it's your position, whatever kind of comes to mind, but just to help me understand you and to let everyone else get a sense of your, um, your place. So I would love for you to go ahead and do that right now. I'm gonna make my screen a little bit bigger here as well, and I'll change my mind. So let's pause and we will do that. Diane, would you share with us your word? Um, mine's loving on others. That's what I think my superpower is, is just caring and showing other people that somebody cares about them. So Awesome. Are you in a, your own business right now or do you work for another company? Um, both. <laughs> so I have my, my own company. Um, I'm a commercial uh, lending broker. So okay. I do uh, loans and uh, commercial lending for businesses. And then I also am on staff at the South Metro Denver Chamber of Commerce. Oh, nice. Wonderful. Well, well, yeah. Okay. We've got Renee. Go ahead, Renee. Unmute and tell us a little more. Working on it. Okay. Um, I tend to be very positive and I'm able to find a silver lining in situations that maybe are not so pleasant. And okay. so I work with parents and my goal is to make their positive, their parenting experience positive. Good. Well, we all need that. I'm a parent. I've got four kids at home, so I'm all about looking for ways to make parenting positive. <laughs> maybe we'll have to do a, uh, another call another time, Dr. Renee. <laughs> Wonderful. So I've heard you and you are you are filled with positive energy so I'm glad to see you here thanks for joining us how about you Danielle yeah. well, I think, um, empathy and I use I use that in a whole bunch of different ways um, you know even I, so I'm a project manager and um, I was you know I use it when I'm doing user testing um, you know how are people going to perceive this um, really empathizing with the user um, also with coworkers and friends and family. So I think it's a, uh, something about myself that I use um, all the time. That's a great work for you, Danielle. Thank you for Thanks. sharing. Thanks. Okay, how about Kevin? I see you back there. What do you got, Kevin? Can you hit your unmute button for us? Yeah, sorry about that. There you go. I, okay. It's like I may have done this wrong, Cindy. I was typing in my... Uh, renaming my name rather than adding the, uh, the tag. Uh -oh. gotcha. <laughs> but uh, my, my um, passion has been uh, new technology in the veterinary profession. Perfect. Yep. 
Kevin and I have done some work together in the past. He is the CEO of Vet Measure, and actually, we're going to dive into a couple of his slides later today. And you guys are going to be on on the hook to help him out and tell him some of your feedback based on the tips that we learned today. And our final person, I believe your name. I'm so sorry, your name's not on the screen anymore. Is it Sarah? <laughs> Susie. Is it? Susie, okay. <laughs> 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 You're a people connector, so you'll probably forgive me for that one. Tell us a little yeah. bit about you. <laughs> um, yeah, I do sales and business development for a company called Page Ship. And um, I am, I just, it's easy for me to figure out how to connect with people, like the, the questions to ask and the way to connect and find something that we can relate to is just an easy kind of superpower that I have. Now I know who you are, Susie. You are Sharice. <laughs> nice That's right. I'm so glad that you're here. Wonderful. Okay, if everyone could just go ahead and mute, you're welcome to keep your, your screens on. We're going to get going. I appreciate you guys showing me a couple of your words. You're welcome to rename yourself with your real name. You would like at least first name maybe so I can call on you, but buckle up. We are going to move. So these are just a few pieces about um, the clients that I've helped in the past. For those of you who don't know me super well, I have, I'm Cindy Skalicki and I started On Point Communications five years ago. This is a smattering of the clients that I've helped with their messaging. I have two big buckets of services I provide. The first bucket is public speaking coaching, which is presentation skills, but goes beyond just nonverbals and eye contact and hand motions. I love digging into content, meaning what is your script say? What are your slides? look like and what are the logical components of that flow. So I do everything and anything related to helping you nail things on stage or through Zoom or with other people, no matter what that looks like. The second bucket that I help people with has to do with brand consulting. So I run a five part brand program with small to medium sized companies. And that comes from my background at a top five ad agency early in my career. I have a master's degree in rhetoric from the University of Georgia. I have experience with public relations and just any and all things messaging, but I love, love, love working with people to help them shine. So that's the quick one-two punch on me. Okay, let's talk about what we're gonna talk about today. I love this cartoon. Occasionally I'll post this on LinkedIn. It says, my presentation lacks power and it has no point. I assumed the software was going to tear up that. So we all know that's not what happens when it comes to PowerPoint presentations. You've got to do a little bit of that work. So I wanted to talk about how we pay attention and what kinds of things we are seeing in terms of data, frankly. Here's something that happened with a Microsoft study. The human attention span has reduced from 12 seconds which is not long, right, in 2000 to eight seconds today. So when you're doing this webinar, I have probably lost your attention at least once or twice already. But when you look at that data, it really does help you understand how important it is to keep things interesting for your audience. And I appealing, you know, and appealing your messaging can be the more likely you are to pay attention. So if I didn't ask you to do this already, but I will at this time to go ahead and like shut your phone ringers off, close out your windows and give me that full attention for the next 50 minutes. I also thought it would be interesting to see what happens in the workplace. So the average American spends about nine hours a day work. So from an eight hour day to a nine hour day, but that work focus, that real deep focus actually only adds up to, from according to this study, about six hours a week, which is means we're doing a lot of other busy work and multitasking throughout the day. The human brain, let's look at this from a physical perspective. It's only able to focus for up to two hours at a time before it needs about a 20 or 30 minute break. That's why people build breaks into workshop days and into you know, you know, pitch demo days. I do a lot of those. We need to have those breaks, even if it's just to go grab a cup of coffee or you know, grab a snack. We've got to build breaks and to switch the gears on our brains. Also, with regard to COVID-19 and all the things that have changed here, this quote is from, uh, or this piece is from um, some of the work that I've done around Zoom calls. And um, 
sorry, I'm just letting somebody in right now. Um, this says the daily US mobile user volume rose to a record of 0.84 million in the end of March. So we're doing so much stuff on screens and that can really hamper our abilities to pay attention. So slide decks are actually one of the ways that you can flex that muscle and help people pay more attention. So what are we gonna do in the next 45 minutes? We're gonna talk about what happens when slides are slumpy. I just came up with this word yesterday because I love my little savvy slides, you know, phrase, but slumpy slides aren't great. They're just, they, they can make the feel kind of slumpy and it just sort of worked for that descriptor. We're gonna talk about what happens when that happens. Then I'm gonna teach you these seven tips. How do you really grab people and create um, that savvy feeling so that you come across professionally and um, you will love these tips. They are actionable today. Then we're going to do an interactive approach and we're going to work together. I will be asking you to unmute, maybe even raise your hands. Just in your screen, you don't need to mess with the little blue hand since we don't have an enormous group. But we're going to do some analysis and I'm going to ask you to put your skills to work about what we've learned. And then I do have a bonus offer for those of you who can stick around to the end. I want to tell you a little bit about a course that I have built that includes this as one of the core components. And it just is a wonderful way for you to totally up your skill sets in presenting and in the content development. Okay, so you might be, you know, a, this might look like a distant memory, this kind of empty stage with an audience that's not there yet, right? And I know someday we will return to stages like this, but you know what? All these little red squares that are the seats in this audience, you could easily look at those as the Zoom squares that are on your screen when you have a presentation to give. And you want to wow them, right? You want to make them really continue to pay attention and, and be engaged with you. So this is just a, a little example of sometimes what I see when I'm in the audience and the facial expressions I have made, maybe just internally, hopefully not a lot of external. But uh, you know, somebody will start to pitch and something will kind of catch my eye. Sometimes that's a misspelling or a mispunctuation mark. Then I see that something else is kind of off. Maybe the picture is like halfway off the screen or it's pixelated. The next thing I'm noticing is that the person themselves is just turning around and looking at the screen or doing something else that's distracting to the audience. And before long, I have kind of gotten frustrated and given up on paying really close attention to that person. I'm going to guess that a lot of you have felt these feelings yourself, and they are no fun. So what happens when slides are slumpy? We feel confused about the information that the person's trying to convey. That is not a good feeling. We also feel overwhelmed a lot when there's too much on the slide. That is probably probably one of, that is the t one of the top three problems that I see in slide decks. There is too much and the person who's delivering the slide has not done the editing that's necessary to make it consumable. The third piece, you just get frustrated. You want the speaker to do a good job for you. You're there to learn, you're there to be persuaded and gather information. We don't want to walk away feeling like we didn't get it. That means you kind of walk off feeling annoyed by the whole situation. And was this a good use of your time or where else might you have put your hour or half hour into something that would have been more productive? So you kind of check out. A lot of times if you're sitting in an audience or you're on a Zoom call that's lacking interest and innovation and energy, you check out, you grab that phone and you start scrolling through the texts that are popping up on your phone. So this is kind of what we're, we're really working to avoid this, right, everybody? We don't want to see people in our audiences or on our Zoom calls that are feeling this way. Even if they're not looking this way, we don't want them feeling bored. We are going for message mastery, and that is what we're attacking today. And I'm telling you, I've seen people who have no slide savvy at all, who've come to me with super slumpy slides, and then they can really enact these seven tips and get better at delivering and they are on their way. So how do you keep your slide deck 
on point. We have seven tips and I'm gonna start with these and I'm peppering into this a couple of examples. After I hit the first five, we're gonna do a little exercise to demonstrate those five tips. Then I have the final two tips, a short exercise to demonstrate those. And then we're gonna play. We're gonna get into some slides that you can help me with and determine what's good and what's not. Okay, first things first. Organizing your whole slide deck is a process. And that's just me saying to you, don't worry if you don't have it all the way right the first time around. For example, I do a lot of work with founders who are pitching investors. I do a lot of work with sales teams who are developing kind of that canned sales pitch that they're gonna give multiple times. When you sit down to develop that slide deck, you know, organizing the slides, that's a process. That also means that organizing the content on each singular slide is also a process. So there's an editorial process that you must go through. After you've done that first round draft, you've got to go back through and start looking at how many words are on the slide. What are the titles and are they interesting? You want to look at your slide deck the way that your audience is going to receive it more so than speaker perspective that you will have as you give it. So you want to you know, draft that deck and then you want to click through it and pretend that you're the audience. Is it making sense? Do you like the order and the flow? Is it too much or too little? And then you kind of go through and you edit. And I have a great video at my YouTube channel that you can look at. It's called How to Edit Slides three steps, and it really makes a big difference if you take those steps. Slides two and three are connected, so they're gonna pop up here at the same time. Tip number two is don't cram. We do not want to Costco applesauce our audience. So what does that mean? That is a term that I, the, I just came up with it because this is my analogy. If you have a six month old baby at home and it's time for that baby to start on solid food, you don't put the little baby into the high chair and unscrew the Costco applesauce container, plop it on their tray and give them a one cup measuring cup to start feeding themselves, right? They have never seen that applesauce before. They've never tasted it. They don't know what it is or how to use it. And so you do that for them by getting a little bowl out of the cupboard and a small spoon that's rubbery and you start feeding it to them one tiny bite at a time. The same principles apply for your slide decks. You want to give your audience bite-sized pieces instead of dumping everything on them at one time. Because just like the applesauce to the baby, you know, your folks that you're talking to, they have not seen your slide deck before. They don't know your company. We don't know what they don't know. So you gotta go slower. In line with that is number three. The slide build is so powerful. And I am building a slide right now for all of you. And instead of showing you all seven tips at once, I'm going one piece at a time so you can absorb it. So you can focus on the one line that's just appeared or the two, and you can really absorb what's, what's being taught. So often people just think it takes longer to build a slide and I just completely disagree. It can take longer if you haven't rehearsed the delivery, that's true. But if you're good at keeping it to a couple sentences per bullet, you can actually keep good pace as a speaker to avoid talking too long about one thing. Okay, the fourth piece here is you wanna go with as as much as possible, less than 25 words on the slide. Over that, you know, there's, there's a little bit of wiggle room, of course, 25, 30, but you really want to avoid full sentences unless it's a quote or unless it's a data point, like I was showing you on the early slide there. But by and large, we don't want full sentences. We want phrases. That's what your audience can grab to remember what you're saying, but you want them listening to you. So trying to keep it under that number is a great rule of thumb no matter what. Five, titles are tools. So instead of you know, having a slide that says competition or 
market size if you're a founder. Or you're doing a sales pitch and it says introduction, right? Like barf. <laughs> we do not want slides that say introduction or closing or, um, you know, really boring things like that are just not going to engage your audience. So you're always talking to your audience, whether it's you, you know, personally and with your voice and your body, but also your slides are talking and that happens through all sorts of sensory things like color, images, and titles. So I'm going to pause here. We've got five tips on the screen out of the seven and I want to walk you through an exercise that helps you see all these points come to fruition. Are we ready? Anyone have any questions about these five pieces? You have 10 seconds to raise your hand. <laughs> 10, nine, eight, okay. So this is a slide that might be your first draft for a slide deck that you're building. So this was a, and I kind of made this up, of course, to, to prove a point, but let's say I was trying to create a slide about rehearsal techniques, which I did do. Let's say I was looking online for examples and tips, and I grabbed something from an article and I plopped it right into my PowerPoint slide. This is so often how we start slide content, right? We pull things from other things. So this is my first slide, but now I will ask you guys to unmute and raise your hand just in your screen. Tell me what's wrong with this. Let's do three things. Remembering the five tips from before, what is not great. Who's got something? Renee? Too many words. Perfect. Way more than 25. Danielle? There's some sentences in here. <laughs> there are sentences. Yes, lots of sentences. Mm -hmm. Anyone have a third? There's no color. Yeah, yeah, there's no color or any kind of anything to like get your eye to be caught to it. It's yep. just black and white. So totally. This is, I see this a lot in the, um, that in companies that are from like national labs or universities. I see so much of this from the academic environment. And that's a, a subset of people I do a lot of work with to help them brush it up. So good. Also, the, the other thing I want, well, here, let's move forward here. So this is the second iteration. There's three iterations total. Iteration number two. So I'll call out a couple simple things that I know you guys noticed. Number one, we've got some color, okay? It's okay. It's not like, you know, crazy awesome. Maybe it's the branding colors of the company. I don't know. It's not mine, but it's okay, not awesome. I also added a third point, which is nice as far as this edit, uh, um, because I know that people threes, and that's just true across the board. People remember things in threes and they think in three, beginning, middle, What else about this? Obviously, there's still too many words, but is there anything else that's annoying you if you were to be looking at this slide? I think it's too much information, the, the cram, cramming piece. Cram, too much yep, Costco applesauce happening. How about you, Renee? Um, it's missing the three. It's one, two, it is, and then there's no three. Yes, attention to detail, Diane. Um, along with the missing the three, the spacing is driving me really crazy. <laughs> Good. I, I'm so glad it's driving you crazy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a balanced person, and it seems really unbalanced with like yes. the squishingness and anyway. <laughs> yep, exactly. Okay, so here is our final slide. And this one is so much better on a lot of levels. And you know what? There could be a additional piece you might add or change, but this is the slide that I've crafted and it's got a new title, Practice Makes Perfect, which is something we're all familiar with. It's a phrase we're familiar with from our childhood even. And I've got gotten rid of all that junk with, with regard to the sentence structure and the full sentences and the spacing. I took away the numbers. I just pushed things to the far left, practice versing, visualizing. Those are my three points. And I have some small little notations underneath each one. And I would deliver this slide like this. Okay, the other piece that I added, as you can see, is an image. 
And so if I were giving a workshop, I might know this image, tell a short story about it, because that is a picture of me actually rehearsing something in a room. I didn't know the person took this photo, but they got this and it works well with this slide. So as a speaker, I would click and I would talk to you about practicing. I would tell you about what it's defined as and how to do it. The next thing I would do is teach you how to rehearse and why it's different than practicing. It's because you have more people, more bodies in the room. Then I would teach you this awesome strategy that I've developed called how to rehearse without actually rehearsing, which is a great strategy when you're trying to kind of commit things to memory. The final piece here is visualizing and I would add to, to that and try to loop everything together on the slide before I move on to the next slide. So there's an image here, there's a title, we're under 25 words, we've got no sentences, and I have not Costco applesauce anybody so far. So we from this to this, and we're feeling a lot better all the way around. All right, now that was one exercise to demonstrate those first five points. I have two more points to teach you, and then we're going to do more of that interactive piece. So piece number six, we did see a glimpse of this previously, but images of people, they work faster to communicate with your audience than any other kind of image. So let me just rephrase that to be clear. Some kind of image is better than none at all, no question, and it doesn't always have to be people. But research shows that even if you have a picture of a phone, a cell phone on your, um, on your slide, if there's a thumb or a hand that's holding that phone, it has the ability to connect more with the audience because there's a human being as a part of the photo. We are wired to connect with other humans. So any kind of body part, to be honest with you, that's in your photo is gonna be better than just the plain image of the, of the software or the piece that you're trying to show. Showing someone using it makes a big impact. So, Images of people, especially if they have emotions that they're feeling at that time, you know, in a sales pitch, for example, showing people who are frustrated or who are sad, whatever the emotion is you want to instill. If you put that on the screen, I can immediately and so quickly determine what the feel is of that slide rather than you spending a minute or more explaining to me, you know, the void that exists in your customer segment, for example, you know, be, uh, without a photo. Um, you would have to verbalize that to me for much longer than what I can get out of a photo. Finally, we're gonna use lines. I'm gonna show you an example right now of a slide that's not great, and then I'll show you kind of the corrected proportion of that. But this feature in your PowerPoint decks, or um, your programs, is so useful, and it does exactly what Diane was talking about when it comes to like where did my eye go because that is a huge component of um, absorbing a slide. So here is an agenda slide that I use in one of my other webinars that's for how to you know have great zoom credibility. It's an agenda slide. So I'm going to look through and walk through the, these things but it's really clunky. It's kind of slumpy because I've got some pieces in intact here from the seven that we've used but not quite enough and it's not it's not the nest, okay? So I've got an image, that's great. It's got a person, it's related to my topic. I have three pieces and three components. I don't have full sentences. I'm following the rule of 25 words or less. I even have a fairly interesting title, but the nine components not really grabbing me. There's too much white space. It's not evenly distributed. I don't really like it. It's not you know, razzing me. Kevin, do you have a question? Anything? Or I didn't know if I saw your hand. You're good. Um, no, I'm not at the moment. Thank you. You're okay, you're good. So this is the change that I made. And this has to do with lines and how you can adjust what you have delivered so that it's more interesting. So if we go back, you know, what I've done is I've, I've way up that image on the right side so it takes up the entire right side. I also moved all the text to the left side and I added some lines. So you can see on this slide, I've made a very thick border around the photo. That is a six point line around the, 
um, for the border that image. And what, and I do this a lot because it gives images a frame. It looks like they're framed and it really makes it look crisp and sharp and professional. The other thing you may have noticed, see the bottom here on the right, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, I was like, that's fun. I like filling in blanks. So I went ahead and filled in the blanks to teach some of the people in my audience what I would suggest about the agenda and I walked them through that. On the left side of this screen, I used a very thick blue line to, to, to sort of um, divide the title and then thinner blue lines to just break out the components of the agenda. So this would be an example of how to use lines and borders and images of people to help establish better slide savvy. Okay, we are through the seven parts, the seven tips. Does anyone have any questions before we move on? I'm gonna check my time, 11.35, perfect. I'm curious what you think about, I, I mean, I see people use images like that are cartoon images you know, or drawings of people? Do you think that using a real human is better than a cartoon? <laughs> That's a great question, Danielle. I would have to say it depends, sorry. <laughs> but it, it um, personally, I would say that has a lot to do with the brand and their brand personality. Some, uh, for example, I just finished, or I was reading a book, um, you know, highly credible author, called um, Expert Secrets, Malcolm something, I can't remember his, his last name, I think. Anyway, all throughout the book, he's got stick figures to demonstrate you know, what to do about, and it's the, the point was, this is easy, this is simple. And so he was trying to help us as an audience me member engage with him in a very simple way. So that worked for me. Now on slide decks, I personally like human beings, I would say, probably more so than stick figures, but if you have a playful brand and it calls for it, I think that they can work for sure. Anyone else have a thought there or a question? Awesome. Okay, let's apply what we've learned. Go ahead and unmute everybody so we don't have to waste time pushing that button and just kind of raise your hand if you want to just, we're gonna do some kind of rapid fire like, let's see how well you guys were listening. <laughs> so tell me what's right or wrong with this slide. This is a roadmap, a business plan that I grabbed and there's a couple clear things, but what would you, you know, what, what do you see that this speaker tried to do and maybe needs, how would you finesse this? It's messy. Kevin. Oh, sorry. Okay, Kevin. Yeah, too many, too many words, and uh, it's just uh, showing a timeline with lots of data that you may want to divide into two slides. Yeah, okay. Two slides would be good. Uh, good option. Susie, messy, I heard. Yeah, it's just messy. Like, the things don't stay in the boxes that are there, so why have them? Yep. Yeah, they are not centered. I mean, you can hardly see the dotted lines that are going around. Like, it was like, good try but not quite all the way there. I can see the dotted lines. Um, obviously the numbers look terrible, but that might've been a formatting issue on the computer. Uh, what would you do to make this better if you were delivering the slides? Forget about um, you know, the things we've already shared, but what would, how, if you were gonna deliver this slide, what might you say or what might you do to add to it? Maybe a color background, you know, not have it be so white. Okay. Very monochrome, right? Yeah. Color would be gray. Diane? I would also, the, the they've got kind of the titles at the top and then the, the information below it. If you wanted to leave it like this, I would take off the information below and that would be what you would just talk about. You wouldn't mm -hmm. have it actually printed on the slide. Yep, that's perfect. I love it. I do want to address one thing. You know, so often I'll give people an, like a slide deck audit and tell them what I see and what I think is, is 
uh, good and what I think needs work. Sometimes speakers don't have time to make all the changes that I suggest that they make, which I completely understand. So for example, if someone came to me and was like, I have a presentation in an hour and this slide needs help, what would I say? I'd say fix the years, obviously, so that they look good. Maybe you can add a long stripe of a color at the bottom just to give it something else, maybe red or, or blue or something, a big thick stripe of color at the bottom to break it up. And then one of the pieces you can also do is create an add-on. And that just means that you create a red box and you plop it on the year that you think is the most important in this timeline, or you add an arrow and you build it in with the animation feature and you say, you have an arrow pointing at 2022 and when you're presenting the slide, you say, but this is the year that we are gonna see the most growth and that's what I want to remember about this slide. So sometimes if you don't have a ton of time, you can still do some cool things to keep your audience's attention and um, leave with a bang. Okay, what I wanna show you about this slide and I'm gonna maybe just um, keep plugging through and decide which slides I want you to chime in on. Um, this one is an addition with lines. This is a great example of lines being really helpful to the audience. This is Sarah and she was presenting at Innisfear a few years ago and she also built this slide from the left column to the right one at a time. That's a huge help. She did not Costco applesauce her whole audience by trying to throw everything up at once. But those thin blue lines weren't there before. And you can see how that would have been distracting. Now, if I had to you know, really nitpick, I'd say, okay, let's center everything that's in that center section because that science starter guy needs to kind of move over to the right. You know, there's little pieces, but really makes a big difference with the line that underlines the title and goes um, vertically between each of those columns. Here is a great title slide that came out of a university setting um, in, uh, a few years back. That I, it's an example of a hand holding the phone to show that human touch and users you know, really make a difference when you're showcasing images. I also love the title of the talk. And it just says, welcome to the future of batteries. The name of the company is Beyond Lithium. Most people would not know what in the world that means if it didn't have these two things, the image of the phone with a low battery and someone holding it, and also, whoops, um, the title, Welcome to the Future of Batteries. Clearly, we can deduce that they are gonna address the problem of slow charging phones. This is a title slide that was from the Rockies Venture Club Investor Forum that I was at last fall. This is me, Padrino, a wonderful title slide. Just what do you guys like about it? Tell me right away. It's clear. It's easy to read. There's a big picture, lots of color. Yep. Beautiful, bright color. Great picture, a nice close-up. Anybody else have thoughts? I like the spacing and this, you know, just how they have the the spacing and the words listed. It's, you know, it's clean. It's not real messy. Very simple. Like you do not always need to have your contact information and the date of your presentation on the title slide anymore. You want that for your send away slide deck. You want it at the end, perhaps, so that you can remember, you know, if you're in a corporate environment, you want to have that but it doesn't always have to be on the title slide. You wanna be, you wanna really wow people from the very beginning. This slide always gets a lot of feedback. So throw at me a few things that are wrong with this problem slide. Diane. It's the writing is so small. I mean, yeah, it's, it's terrible. Hard to, it's hard By to read way, it. This is the multi-billion dollar company, Air. B&B, just for those wondering. So clearly, this did not hamper their ability to fundraise, but not, not is it. What else is, is something that you would change if this was your slide? Susie? Um, Susie? Just that the background is, um, because it says a word, you get, you can't decide which one to focus on because it's not translucent or anything. So 
Yeah, in fact, the, the piece that I would recommend that this person could have done was to, I love the hotel image, it really is great, but if you could put the photo and push it down to the bottom half of the slide, up the font size on these lines and give me a better title, um, that would be a couple of mm -hmm. uh, recommended yeah. improvements. Perfect. I'm gonna keep moving. This demonstrates, um, I had a client who worked on, uh, her phrase was the burnout escalator. And the burnout escalator is what you might be feeling when you're burnt out from work. So she built this slide and used this overlay of gray to denote negative. So black and white is a great way to demonstrate negative emotion quickly and simply. So that is uh, a great tool. You can have slides that are full image from border to border, top to bottom, left to right. And if you lay over it a transparent gray slide or any other color, um, that can really help. Um, I also have a picture here. This is a like a shipwrecked ship, full color, gray. It, it's a, like a negative picture. So here's the example. This is now the same image, black and white. So when you show it in color, like, okay, I, I'm, I'm driving with you. But when you add that black and white component, it really does kind of help you see that what we're talking about right now is negative and there needs to be, it, it invites you to want the color. And so as a speaker, you're inviting your audience to want a change. This is, I think, the last one before we get to um, Kevin's slides. I've got a quote here, and I love using quotes. I fully believe they should always be all the way on the slide when you have a quote. I read one all the time from Aristotle about the definition of rhetoric in some of my work, and I put it all the way up on the slide, and I read it right to the audience. If you've got a direct quote, read it verbatim. But design-wise, um, there are some things that I would suggest that we do differently, like, um, and this I see a lot. So for example, if you had a cursor, I would put the cursor right before the word but and hit enter so that but to thrive is all on one line, right? And then the other piece I would do is fix the one at the bottom so that style is not on its own. So readability when you're writing things in um, in your slides or even in, I'm so sorry, this is advancing. I got it, it must be on a timer. Uh, you know, you want to help people grab hold of the words and the content in chunks so that it's easy for them to absorb. I'd probably move the quote marks. You know, there's a little, little bits here and there that I would do to really perfect it, but it's not terrible. It's a good black and white photo of a, you know, really wise quote. The woman is there who said it. So it's definitely nice, but I'm nitpicking about it. Okay, for our audience, we've got a few slides and I'd love to have you all share your thoughts with Kevin. Kevin, do you wanna give us a, like 30 seconds about what these slides are part of, about which relates to your deck? Okay, yes, our, our pitch deck is, um, has gone through mo multiple iterations. Um, the slides that you'll see really define the market and uh, the opportunity. Uh, so you're, the problem as well, the problem first of all, then the market opportunity. So uh, that's, it, there's probably too many words, <laughs> too much information, but yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay, so let's Kevin our honest feedback. This is Kevin's problem slide. So Kevin is a, a, an expert in veterinary technology. So I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna say anything. I would love for you all to share with Kevin, uh, remembering the seven steps that we learned, the seven tips, what could he do to improve this slide? I would right. cut out some words. If you're actually presenting it out loud, I would take out some words and just use them as key points as opposed to full sentences. I love the picture and there's a person in it. I, I was looking at the dog, but there is a person in it. <laughs> Good job, Kevin. <laughs> other thoughts? Pardon me? I said other thoughts from the others. Let's, I want you guys to think, this actually reminds me of the slide I showed you, but showed you all after point five. Do you guys remember the agenda slide? 
This kind of looks like the before version of the agenda slide that I showed you. So what did I, what was the correction that was made and, and would that work here? Lines. Lines. What would you say, Diane, where, where might some lines work? I think they would work between the three points, you know, reducing some of the words in the three points and then, kind of, you know, divvy them up with the lines just to break those, break those three different issues up, I guess. I also think that if you do the lines, Kevin, take out the bullets, the little circle bullet, like just have your, you know, you want probably a maximum of two lines of text per bullet. So you have the first bullet right here is three lines of text and then two and then three. So if you can reduce that, that would be awesome. I'm actually gonna flip all the way back to show, cause here's what I'm thinking. What if you did the same fixes that I showed in the earlier agenda slide. Um, this girl with the dog could be half the slide. She could have a, like a big thick black background to frame the, the actual photo. And then if we scooted all the text to the left side, just like I did with the agenda slide previously, it could really sing. Let's see if we go all the way back to this example. So this looks a little bit like the slide that you just showed, right, Kevin? I mean, in general terms, mm -hmm. what if it had a look that was a little bit more finished like this? So it's just an example and something to think about or try, um, but it's one interesting option for you to, to see. It would kind of spice it up, I think. All yeah, right, I'm gonna forward. Go ahead, Kevin. I think that makes sense and the uh, good, good suggestion on removing the bullet points, shortening the text, uh, trying to get, <clears throat> you know, trying to get it more concise and then enlarging the image. Mm -hmm. I awesome. think I'd also take the problem off because I, you can tell them what the problem is. They can see it. If, if the picture was of somebody who looked stressed out while trying to monitor, if she looks very happy. Um, uh, good point. But the psychologist in me is like, <laughs> you know, and, and the positive person wants to see a positive picture, but if you're talking about the pain point and the problem, if you see somebody there writing something down, looking like they're in a hurry or looking like they're stressed out, that conveys the problem. And then when you have a solution, you'll see somebody like that. Yeah, we were, we were trying to define the slides with the exact wording that's suggested for pitches. So what do you think, Cindy, Cindy about that? I think that my, my initial thought after Renee said that is if it's a send away slide deck, you probably do want to keep that problem word in there. Um, but you might be able to communicate a problem by saying, by using up words like, I mean, you already have in terms of the words inefficient and expensive. Those are not desirable words for companies or vet technicians, right? Um, so that's, that's a personal decision, depending on how you, the presenter, are gonna deliver this slide. You can verbally say, here's our problem. We've got inefficient, expensive, post-surgical monitoring, blah, blah, blah. And you can use that as a verbal cue. Um, but if it's a send away, I'd, I'd probably keep the word up there so they know where you are. The okay. other thought I have is that black and white photo idea that we showed. This is a problem slide, but to Renee's point, we have a happy, colorful picture. So let's go to this next slide for Kevin. This is um, using some of the pieces that we talked about. What do you all see here that he did well and what might you suggest for a change, if anything? There are lines. We do have lines. <laughs> I didn't think to do that before, so now I'm very in tune to that. And I like the little <laughs> pictures. You know, I like, there's, there's a little graphic for each thing. The icons are great. Yep. Yeah. I do see a single word under this. I'm getting picky on you, Kevin, but on the measure on under the dog, it relates back to the Maya Angelou quote. You know, you've got one little word metrics. You might find a way to hit enter after the comma or not with that. So it's easily, you know, consumable for your audience. But I think this is pretty good. You could try that really thick, solid, all the way edge to edge blue line under technology solution to, to split. If you do that for, that would be something you'd consider doing consistently throughout the whole deck, but it would 
set aside the, um, the title portion of each slide, the top, whatever, eighth of the slide. Okay. But I think it's pretty good. I would also bring up just from my visually, when I'm looking at the far left versus the far right, I think those boxes are the same size, but because the way the text is reading, it looks like the one on the left is shorter and smaller than the one on the right to me. So I would say, you know, it just like you said, um, Cindy did, you know, have the text in the first box be two lines match the two lines that are in the far right or make it three lines, make, make it so they're both the same. Um, mm -hmm. As far because it just to, to my at least to my eye I'm going okay it looks like the text is more spread out on the right which makes it look like that box is bigger versus on the left because it it returned down it's on three lines it looks smaller so it looks right. a little like lopsided in a way visually that's all Kevin my last piece on this slide if you're looking at my little um, thumbnail video is I would here's the middle section I think you can go like this just a smidge to make okay. it the lines a little the margins a little wider because you have the most amount of text in the center section but it looks like it's the narrowest okay good point okay hey, so do you have a uh, question about the the copyright thing so on the first slide there was yeah. like a logo kind of thing and then now it's switched to this um, or yeah there was a yeah, on the previous slide, it said that measure on the left, and then there was the copyright, and then the rest of these have, is it, is that a good place to put that, is in the bottom center, or is it, like, on the right, do you, bottom, um, that? You, so, interesting point, Kevin, you've got your logo on, and I just got these three slides to review, Kevin, but you've got the logo on the lower left on the problem slide, it's not on this slide which is your hero slide, right, Kevin? <laughs> the solution slide should always have your logo. And then it is on the third slide. So that's a great question. Um, to answer your question, Danielle, I don't have a preference of exactly where the logo should go, but it should be consistent. Um, it, it's not necessary to have it on every single slide necessarily, but it always should be on your title slide. It always should be on what I call a hero slide where you introduce the solution or the new product or whatever it might be. And it always should be on your closing slide. Okay. And in between, it's up to you. Um, it certainly helps with, you know, brand I identity for sure. Okay. Kevin? Thoughts on adding it to this one or figuring yeah, out a way about, to... Thanks for yeah. bringing that up. I, I think that's really good uh, analysis because I, you know, we don't probably have a consistent use of our logo throughout mm -hmm. the deck. So beginning yeah. and hero slide and end makes a lot of sense. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and just jump in since we're running a little low on time. I would add to this slide, um, Kevin, this is, fine in terms of words and I think the title's even okay. It's, it's, you know, what, I mean, sometimes slides can't always be playful with their titles, but you're telling me what you're going to talk about on this slide. Mm -hmm. It's got three bullets, which is good instead of two. Um, but I also would maybe consider how you would mirror this slide to the, the, the first slide we talked about with, you know, is there an image that you could share with this? Maybe it's a bag full of money. I mean, I'm, that's probably not the best option, but something that, that gets your audience to think about benefits or, um, you know, maybe it's a handshake. A lot of handshakes are good options for visuals. Um, but what could you do with, there's just a lot of white space here. It's uneven in terms of my eye um, feeling shoved to the upper left of the slide. So you might consider ways to do that. Um, Kevin, offline, I could share with you an option for, you know, spicing up the all white background that you're using for this deck. And that can be the simplest thing. You just create a, a box, a text box, you fill it with color and you stretch it like a huge um, flat rectangle and you plop it in the bottom third of the slide deck and you can, you know, arrange, you hit the arrange feature and put, put it behind things, but it can be your identifier throughout the whole slide deck. And if that's not making a ton of sense all the way, I'll show it to you.